we said prayer opens the heavens above the believer or above the person who is praying and um, number five we said prayer empowers us to live victoriously over Satan prayer empowers the believer to live victoriously over Satan and so tonight we will start on number six and number six is that prayer is one of the keys to overcoming temptations prayer is is powerful in that it is one of the keys um, that enables us to overcome temptation prayer is a stronghold that shield us and protect us from falling into temptations um, some of the temptations we fall into are because of prayerlessness you know on our part that is one of the reasons the enemy wants to keep us prayerless you know when you are prayerless you are more vulnerable to fall into temptation but when you are prayerful you are able to resist you know temptation your spirit man is strong enough to resist the impulses of the flesh you see prayer empowers your spirit man to gain ascendancy you know over the flesh but prayerlessness weakens your spirit man and the flesh um, you know against ascendancy over your spirit and you fall into sin and that is why fasting is important because you know fasting you know prayer coupled with fasting you know weakens the flesh so that you know you know the spirit man can rise and gain ascendancy and mastery over the flesh fasting does not change God but it changes us now <clears throat> you know when we pray we are able to overcome temptation when we live a life of prayer we're able to overcome temptation it's not that we become perfect beings but we are able to overcome temptations when we pray we are more vulnerable to temptations and to sin more susceptible to sin and more vulnerable to temptation when we are prayerless than when we are a prayerful that's one of the reasons why the enemy wants to keep us prayerless because if we are prayerless then we become spiritually weak to overcome certain temptations he brings our way it is as the believer lives a life of consistent prayer that he or she is able to exercise dominion over every temptation that would come against them obviously including the works of the of the flesh prayer is the key to overcoming temptations and promoting holiness in the church and in the believers life a prayerful believer is always fortified and prepared to meet temptation and that is why the enemy fights you when you pray fights me when when i pray he wants to keep us weak spiritually so that when he brings temptation we can easily fall in mark 14 verse 38 jesus said this to his disciples watch and pray lest you enter into you enter into temptation the spirit truly really is willing but the flesh is weak jesus told his disciples to watch and pray so that they could not enter into temptation in other words there are certain temptations we enter into because we didn't watch and pray this shows that some temptations we fall into are because of prayerlessness on our part the scripture teaches us that prayer is the key to all spiritual influences in our lives a failure to develop a personal prayer life can leave us spiritually ineffective and weak the spiritual battlefield is our prayer closet it is here we make war against satan and sin and so uh, prayerlessness makes us more vulnerable vulnerable to sin to fall into temptation and when we pray we become spiritually strong and we are able to resist temptation number seven <clears throat> excuse me prayer subdues the flesh and aids holiness prayer subdues the flesh and aids holiness the enemy knows that prayer brings the flesh under subjection to our recreated human spirits and aids holiness prayer produces and maintains a standard of holiness in the believer's life and also in the local church. Moses Aranciola, a great man of God and a prayer warrior, an apostle of prayer, once said, and I quote, the more prayerful you are, the less sinful, and the more sinful you are, the less prayerful. Prayerlessness and sinfulness are inversely proportional to each other. 
Someone also said, I quote, praying will make one lay aside his sinning or else sinning will make him lay aside his praying. The two cannot work together. In other words, when you become, the more prayerful you are, the less sinful you will become. And the, the more prayerless you are, the more sinful um, you will become. Prayer is the number one remedy for the problem of carnality. Um, prayer weakens the flesh, subdues it, and put it in subjection to the recreated human spirit. Through prayer, your spirit man rises and gains ascendancy over the flesh and its desires. Continual prayer weakens the flesh and arms the spirit man to conquer. So if you want to keep the flesh, live a disciplined life of prayer. Prayer empowers us to live victoriously over sin and the flesh. Prayer empowers the spirit man to gain ascendancy over the flesh. And so through consistent prayer, we can put the flesh under subjection to our spirit man. That's why prayer is powerful. Prayer subdues the flesh and aids um, holiness. And then number six, we said prayer is one of the keys to overcoming temptations. Number seven, prayer subdues the flesh and aids holiness in our lives. Number eight, prayer brings personal transformation. Prayer is one of the keys to personal transformation. In other words, prayer has power to transform the life of a prayer or the life of the one who prays. The place of prayer is a place of transfiguration or transformation. All transformations in our lives must begin with prayer. In Luke 9 verse 28, um, the Bible says concerning Jesus, as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. The Bible says this concerning Jesus. Remember, in, in Luke chapter 9, Jesus, you know, asked his disciples, his inner circle of Peter, James, and John, um, he invited them to a prayer encounter, to a prayer retreat in the mountain. And then they accompanied him. And then when they got to the mountain, the Bible says, and as he was praying, you know, it was supposed to say, as they were praying. In other words, you know, uh, because the purpose of going with Jesus to the mountain was to have a prayer encounter, was to pray. But unfortunately, when they got there, Jesus alone was praying. And what, what was happening with the rest, with Peter and company, uh, as you read the Bible says, they were heavy with sleep. And so Jesus took them to the mountain with a view of, you know, having a prayer retreat with these men, a prayer encounter with these men, when he got into the mountain, he prayed alone and they fell asleep. Now the Bible says here in verse 20, as he, that is Jesus, was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. There was, he, the, another translation says he was transfigured. You know, he was transformed. As Jesus was praying, the appearance of his face changed. The word translated appearance is the Greek word eidos, which means visible form, shape, appearance, outward show. Now, in the gospel according to Matthew and Mark, a different word is used. Um, uh, the Bible says he was transfigured before them. That is Matthew 17 verse 2 and Mark 9 verse 2. As Jesus was praying, he was transfigured. Now, the verb here uh, of the word transfigured is the word metamorpho which means to change, to transfigure, or to transform. It means to change into another form. This is the same word used in Romans 12, uh, verse 2, when the Bible says we should not be conformed, be conformed to this world, but we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Uh, that's the Greek word metamorpho, which is a process to change to another form, okay, or to transform. So the word metamorpho means to change, to transfigure, to transform. It means to change into another form. So as Jesus was praying, he was transfigured. He was changed to another form. You see, the place of prayer is a place of transfiguration. The place of prayer is the place of transformation. It is the place where we are being transformed into the very image 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are being transformed. It is a process. Okay? Now, as Jesus praised, he was transfigured. This means his countenance or facial appearance was changed. Matthew's account says his face, you know, shone like the sun in Matthew 17, verse 2. This is reminiscent of what happened to Moses when he talked to God in Mount Sinai. And this is in Exodus 34, verses 29 and 30. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. Moses was in the presence of the Lord when he fasted for 40 days and the Shekinah glory of God was upon him. He was transfigured, he was transformed. You know, the Bible says uh, to the point that he had to put, you know, uh, something, you know, because he shone with the, he was radiant with the glory, you, you know, of God. And when he came down uh, from the mountain with the two tablets, um, his face was radiant because of the Shekinah glory of God. He was transfigured in the place of prayer. He was transformed as he spent days in the mountains alone with God in fasting and prayer. The result is that his face shone with the Shekinah glory of God. Moses' face shone so brightly that he found it necessary, you know, to wear a veil to shield people, you know, from the glare, if you read it from another translation. Prayer, you see, prayer transfigures. Prayer has power to transform us. The place of prayer, therefore, is a place of personal transformation. And so prayer, yes, prayer changes circumstances. Prayer changes situations. But most importantly, prayer changes us. In the place of prayer, we are being transformed from one level of glory to the next. We are being transformed you know, into the very image of Christ. Here's one biblical example of someone who experienced transformation in the place of prayer. Jacob. Jacob was transformed in the place of prayer. Jacob, who was a supplanter, a trickster, you know, he tricked his brother of his birthright. He experienced a breakthrough after a divine encounter with God in the place of prayer. We all know that Jacob tricked Esau out of his birthright and used lies to get ahead in the world. But when he met God and wrestled with him, he finally admitted that he was a cheater and a liar. And after his confession, God changed Jacob's name to Israel. And he, he wrestled with God, the Bible says. It was a wrestling contest. This, this was in the place of prayer. In Genesis 32 verses 24 through 30, it says, And Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And Jacob was left alone. Oftentimes, you know, uh, transformations takes place when we are alone with God in the place of prayer. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I would not let thee go except thou blessed me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Therefore, um, is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Remember, this is the time when Jacob was fleeing and running away from his brother Esau. And then he was left alone, he had an encounter with God, and his life was changed and transformed. In Peniel, Jacob had an encounter with God, which wrote his entire history afresh. Now the word Peniel means facing God. In Peniel, Jacob came face to face with God. He encountered God and his life was never the same. The place of prayer is the place of encounter. And when you encounter God, you are never the same. You are never 
the same. The word encounter means to collide with God. It means a collision. It means to see God face to face. And you cannot meet God face to face in the prayer, in the place of prayer. You cannot encounter God in that level and remain the same. Jacob the supplanter, the crook, had an encounter with God that changed his entire life. And his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. There was transformation there. Verse 28 of Genesis 32 says, And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Jacob experienced a change of name. You know, you see, a name plays a significant role in the life of a person. You know, a name is a purpose carrier. Oftentimes, people reflect the meanings of their names. You know, the word Jacob means supplanter. It means, you know, a crook. It means a trickster. And Jacob lived out that name. He tricked his brother of his birthright. But when he had an encounter with God, his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. His relationship with his brother Esau also changed. Jacob was blessed by God because of that encounter with God in the place of prayer. So prayer is able to transform us, to change us into different people. You cannot come into the presence of God on a daily basis genuinely and remain the same. You know, in the place of prayer, you know, we are changed, we are transformed into the kind of people God desires for us to be. We are being transformed into the very image of his son Jesus Christ according to Romans chapter 8 verse 29 prayer will help us to be more like God it will add to our lives a heavenly glow the primary purpose of prayer is not to change circumstances but the primary purpose of prayer is to change us yes prayer does change circumstances prayer does change situations but its primary purpose you know amongst other things is to change us you know so in the place of prayer we are transformed prayer is powerful prayer has power to transform us number nine the power of prayer is seen number nine in that prayer provokes divine intervention prayer provokes divine intervention the first well-known catalyst for divine intervention is prayer. There are many catalysts for divine intervention, but the first well-known one is prayer, and sometimes prayer coupled with fasting. You know, in other instances, prayer coupled with fasting. Prayer has power to secure divine intervention. Now, what is intervention? Uh, what, what do we mean by divine intervention? Divine intervention is help from God to effect a change that is impossible for men to do. In other words, divine intervention is a sovereign act of God. Divine intervention, you experience divine intervention when no one else can help you um, because they, they don't have power, you know, to do so. And the only person that can, you know, help you is God. You know, divine intervention is when um, God intervenes in your situation, in a situation that looks so hopeless and so helpless that men, you know, uh, you know, could not help you or you could not help yourself. Secondly, divine intervention is when God moves beyond human understanding. When God moves on your behalf beyond human understanding. You know, um, when we talk about divine intervention, we are referring to help from God to effect change that is impossible for men to do. Usually, no man can explain how it happened. It is a sovereign act of God. It is when God steps into your world and change the cause of events with an outcome of his choosing. Prayer is able to secure divine intervention. Oftentimes we face certain circumstances and that defies human logic, you know, that are so big that our minds cannot, you know, comprehend. You know, there's an African proverb that says something bigger than the cricket has entered the cricket's home. If you know a cricket, a cricket is very small. And you know, when something bigger than the cricket enters the cricket's hole, that means the cricket is helpless. And so, and so it is with us. Sometimes we face problems that are bigger than us, that are so big we don't even know where to start. Men cannot help us. 
you know, and that's where, you know, we are able to secure divine intervention. And one of the catalysts, you know, to, for divine intervention is prayer. So prayer provokes heaven. It provokes divine help. It provokes, you know, divine intervention. Provoking God is about knowing how to get his attention so he can intervene in your situation. And one of the ways to get God's attention is through prayer. There are occasions in every man's life when no one wants to help. There are occasions when those who want to help may fail. And that is why you and I need to know how to get God to intervene in our situation. Now, why do we need God's help? There are several reasons, one of which we are not able to help ourselves. Otherwise, we couldn't, you know, uh, solicit God's help if we were able to help ourselves. But sometimes it's because, you know, the problem or the challenge is bigger than we can handle. Also, it's because, you know, in a case where human beings can help us, sometimes they can disappoint us. You know, sometimes they may not be willing um, to help us. You know, sometimes in life we face problems that are bigger than us, problems we cannot solve. And when this happens, we come to the end of ourselves. Problems uh, sometimes bring us to the end of ourselves. You know, sometimes we try to use our own human intellect and wisdom to solve our problems. Um, you know, sometimes we, we, we try to figure out things and sometimes we tell ourselves, I'm going to be able to handle this. I'm going to sort it out. And God gives us that space where we, we try everything we can, everything humanly possible, and we come to the conclusion that we cannot help ourselves. And that's where we run to God. And one way in which we are able to provoke God is through prayer. Um, you know, and oftentimes divine intervention, you know, we, 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 we secure divine intervention through prayer when we have come to the end of ourselves, or when we have come to our wit's end, where we, we don't know what else to do. Let's turn to Psalms 107, verses 23 through 29. Psalms 107, verses 23 through to 29. I read, those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commands and raises the stormy wind, which lifts up its waves of the sea. They mount up to the heavens. They go down again to the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like drunken men and are at their wit's end. Verse 28, then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble and he brings them out of their distress he calms the storm so that its waves are still now the bible talks about you know those who go down into the sea you know in ships you know who do business in great waters you know and what happens as they are in the ship you know it says they see the works of god and while they are sailing in the ship the ship might experience a storm. You know, it experienced a huge storm. It says, for he commands and raises the stormy wind, which lifts up the waves of the sea. And the waves mount up to the heavens. If you've been to, um, to you know, to the ship and, and in the raging sea, you know, when, 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 when the waves, you know, goes up and down, then the, the people begins to reel to and fro. It is a, a, a life-threatening, experience you know the waves you know mount up to the heavens uh, you know with that sheep and then the sheep goes up and down uh, people go up and down in their depths and their soul melts because of trouble you know their soul melts they become hopeless you know i don't know if you've been into that situation where you are in the sheep and 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 and, and there are gigantic waves and, and, and the ship is reeling to and fro, up and down, you know, and, and, and the, the life, I mean, the ship itself is threatened and the life of everybody in the ship is threatened because of the storm. It reminds me of Paul in Acts chapter 27, you know, um, when he was sailing to Rome, um, they experienced the storm called Eurotlidon, you know, it eventually destroyed the ship, but everybody was saved, you know. Um, you know, these people here were having the same experience. They encountered a storm. 
and and it says you know um the waves lifts up the you know it says for he commands and raises the stormy wind which lifts up the waves to the sea they mount up to the heavens they go down again to the depths their soul melts because of trouble the people become hopeless the people become discouraged the people become fearful because of the storm but look at verse 27 they reel to and fro and stagger like drunken men and are at their wit's end they reel to and fro why because of the waves you know the boat and the ship is going up and it's going down it's going up and it's going down it's like that in life sometimes you know where you stagger you know you don't know what to do they stagger like drunken men and are at their wit's end which end simply means they've come to the end of themselves and which means that even those that knew about sheep that knew about navigating the sheep you know they had tried everything humanly possible everything that they knew to try and you know get the sheep you know um intact but they they they, they were not able to do anything they came to the end of themselves they came to their wit's end you know they, their wisdom could no longer help them you know they came to the end of themselves and then look at verse 28 then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble and he brings them out of their distress you know he calms the storm so that its waves are still now take note of the last part of verse 27 and they are at their wits ends that means they come to the end of themselves now what did they do then verse 28 then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble you see in life troubles storms problems sometimes bring us to the end of ourselves and when we come to the end of ourselves we need to do what these people did what did they do they cried out to the Lord in their trouble what does it mean to cry out to the Lord it is to pray sometimes prayer is a cry you know it is a cry for divine intervention you know they were calling on God to intervene in their situation in other words they prayed to the Lord they asked God to intervene in their situation see in times as these when we are at our wits end when we've come to the end of ourselves we must not run away from God but we need to run to him because it is as we run to him that he is able um, to intervene we need to run to God for him to intervene and one of the catalysts for you know divine intervention is prayer so they prayed unto the Lord they cried out unto the Lord now how did God respond to their prayer the Bible says he brought them out of their distress verse 28 says then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he brought them out of their distresses the Lord hears and answers the cries of desperate people over and over again in the Bible people are needy and God is ready to deliver you know at their word some were in trouble because of their sin others because of natural disaster others because they were enslaved by evil men but they all equally felt the need for God and so they cried out to God asking God for intervention and God you know um, uh, brought them out of their distresses now how did he do it uh, verses 29 and 30 tells us how God did it it says he calms the storm so that its waves are still verse 30 then they are glad because they are quiet so he guides them to their desired haven that is Psalm 107 29 and 30 so how did the Lord bring them out of their distress number one he calms the storm in verse 29 this is how he intervened he calms the storm and then in verse 30 he puts a smile back on their faces and he will put a smile on your face once again when he intervenes in your situation he puts a smile back on their faces when you are at your wit's end, at the end of yourself, you see the storm, you know, when you see the storm calm, the sky part and the sun shines through, you will smile again. You know, because, you know, at the time when you were in the midst of the storm, you became hopeless. You know, you became terrified and you were in fear. So he put a smile back um, on them in verse 30. It says, then they are glad because they are quiet. And then so he guides them to their desired haven 
um, that is verse 30. The third thing, he guides them to their desired heaven. That is their desired destination. And you see, you know, in other words, God brought them safely to their desired haven. You know, and all this in response to the cry of the people. You know, prayer is the key, one of the keys to divine intervention. They cried out to God in the midst of their storm and God delivered them and God intervened in their situation. Because of the power of prayer, God intervened in their lives and in their situation. You see, prayer provokes help from above. Help from above is available for every, in every, for every area of our need when we call upon God in prayers. In Psalms 121 verses 1 and 2, the psalmist says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Prayer provokes help from above. The psalmist depended on God for help. He lifted up his eyes unto the Lord. He looked to God because he was convinced his help comes from him. But how does he access God's help? Of course, it is through prayer. Through prayer, we are able to access God's help. We are able to provoke divine intervention. We are able to provoke God's help. It is through prayer that we can solicit God's help in times of trouble. You see, without help from above, we are helpless on earth. In Psalm 60, verse 11 and 12, the psalmist pray, Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of men. Through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of men. Through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. So prayer is not just a means for getting your material needs met. It is also for getting him to intervene in your situation on the basis of his word. God is committed to sending help from above when we call upon him in prayer. In Psalm 50 verse 15, here's another scripture. It says, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Call upon me in the day of trouble. Notice there is a day of trouble. There is a day of trouble. Um, you know, that comes to each and every one of us. And the day of trouble comes suddenly. It comes unannounced. It comes unnoticed. And God says, when that day comes, call upon me. You know, um, call upon me. What does that mean? It means pray to me. So prayer is also, is crying to God, but prayer is also calling on God to intervene in our situation. It is inviting. Prayer is inviting God to intervene in our affairs. Prayer gives God access into our need. It enables him to intervene in our negative circumstances. Without invitation through prayer, God is not able to help us even though he might desire to do so. You know, prayer, through prayer, we give God an earthly license to intervene in the arena of human affairs or in our own situations. Though God knows all and sees all, that is our troubles, our problems, he's not able to do anything for us until we call upon him and ask for his intervention in prayer. In James 5 verse 13, the Bible says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. The Bible says those who are in trouble, those who are suffering must do what? They must pray. Why? Because that is the only way of securing divine intervention. That is the only way of, you know, provoking God to come and intervene in our situation. Let me just give you, uh, you know, two biblical examples of, you know, um, people who secured divine intervention through prayer. The first one is Esther and the, and the Jews in Esther chapter 4 verses 1 through 17. You can read uh, the entire chapter of the book of Esther. Um, this was another crisis time in the history of, you know, um, the children of Israel or Judah. Judah had fallen because of sin 
they were carried to Babylon and Persia. Um, they were carried to Babylon and Persia will become the reigning kingdom at the time after Nebuchadnezzar. Ahasuerus, king of Persia, was very powerful who conquered many nations like King Nebuchadnezzar. Esther becomes the queen because Vashti, the queen, will not expose himself to the king's visitors. We know how Esther replaced Vashti. She's divorced. In God's mysterious ways, that is, Vashti was divorced. In God's mysterious ways, Esther becomes the queen and took, took the place of Vashti. Mordecai, Esther's uncle, will now bow to Haman as Jews do not worship humans. You know, Mordecai refused. You know, that was idolatry. He refused to bow. Mordecai refused to bow. Haman, the man next to the king, plots the elimination of the Jewish people because, because of anger, Mordecai will not worship him. Jewishness was about to be annihilated when Esther went into a three-day fast. We all know of the plot, you know, by Naman, to, you know, but by no, no, Haman to terminate, you know, all the Jews, you know, um, you know, before Adolf Hitler, you know, he was the Adolf Hitler of Esther's day, you know, uh, Haman. He, he came with a plot to, you know, to destroy all the Jewish people, and they, they were about to be annihilated. And then Esther, you know, uh, through Mordecai, who challenged Esther and, and said to Esther, how do you know that God has brought you into this kingdom for such a time as this? And he said, if you don't rise up during this time, help will come from another place and you will perish too. And Esther took the challenge, you know, and you know the story. You can read the entire chapter of Esther, chapter 4. And she asked uh, for a three-day fast. She went to for a three-day dry fast. You see, that's where prayer comes, coupled with fasting, you know. And they prayed, and then God changed the impossible situation because of the prayer of Esther. We see the power of prayer, and we see God's intervening in their situation. And through that prayer, the plot was overturned, you know. Uh, the plot to destroy and annihilate the Jewish nation was overturned. God stopped the wicked hand of Haman against the destruction of the Jewish people. What was the secret? You know, how did God intervene? God intervened because of the fasting and prayer of Esther. And then in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 25, we see, um, you know, how Peter and the church, you know, the early church secured divine intervention through prayer. When the church, the Christian faith was instituted, it was a turbulent time for the church. Severe persecution pounds on the institution of the church in the book of Acts. The enemy, the devil, wanted to wipe out the church. King Herod, ruling Rome at that time, killed James, one of the apostles. He put Peter in prison to be executed the following day to please the people. An angel of the Lord went into the prison and delivered Peter. But you see, the angel did not just go there and deliver Peter. When you read Acts chapter 12, verse 1, when Peter was arrested and the Bible says, you know, prayer, fervent prayer was made for Peter. So a continual prayer was made for Peter and that prayer, you know, provoked divine intervention. And God sent an angel uh, to deliver Peter from prison. The church was praying for Peter and God moved in and brought Peter right at the door where the church was praying for him. God proved he's in control, not kings or political leaders or corporate leaders. God teaches his church that when they pray, he performs miracles and changes impossible situations. So the church secured divine intervention. The life of Peter was preserved. Peter was delivered. Um, because God intervened and God's intervention was provoked by the prayers of the church. Acts chapter 12 from verses 1 through 25. Uh, you can read it. You see, prayer is an invitation. Prayer invites God. Through prayer we give God an invitation, the right to come into man's territory to do whatever we ask him to do. God does not just come to the earth and does whatever he wants to do. No, he comes to earth to intervene at the invitation of man. 
throughout the Bible, every time God came on the scene, every time an angel appeared, etc., it was because of the intercession or sacrifice. It was because of prayer intercession or sacrifice. It was because of invitation by men. So prayer is powerful, and through prayer we can secure divine intervention. Now my last point um, for tonight, number 10. Prayer releases God's grace upon us to cope with circumstances we cannot change. Prayer releases God's grace for us to cope with circumstances we cannot change. There are certain things that we go through in life as believers. There are certain unpalatable situations and circumstances that we go through as believers. In Isaiah 43 verse 2, the Bible says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. <clears throat> Notice, the Bible says when, not if. In other words, most definitely, there will be times and seasons when we will need to pass through rivers and through waters. What does that speak of? That speaks of turbulence. That speaks of trouble. That speaks of affliction. That speaks of, you know, the challenges that we'll go through. There are certain things we will go through in life. God will allow us to go through those situations. God will allow us to go through those circumstances. And there is no prayer that would stop us from going through those circumstances. You see, God will allow us to go through those circumstances. And you know, the circumstances God allows us to go through, He grants us the grace to cope. He grants us the grace to be able to go through them and to come out on the other side changed, to come out on the other side having matured, and to come out on the other side, uh, you know, becoming men and women of character. Sometimes, you know, the purpose of prayer is to get us out of circumstances. But more often than not, the purpose of prayer is to get us through the circumstances. You see, sometimes there are times where we pray, you know, you know, we pray against certain situations, we pray against certain challenges, and um, we are trusting God to stop certain challenges from coming our way. We are trusting God to stop certain problems or to take away certain problems. And instead of those problems, you know, um, being taken away, we wonder why they are not being taken away. You know, and we wonder why. Why is God not answering this prayer? How come I have been praying, you know, concerning this situation and it looks like God is not changing this situation? Well, the situation that God does not change, even when we pray, is the situation He wants us to go through. And when we go through such situations, you know, we don't go through such situations alone. And when we go through such situations, it is for our benefit. And because God wants to use the same situations the enemy has ordained for our destruction, God wants to use those situations, you know, for our benefit, to grow us, to mature us. And, and, and to transform us and to develop, you know, character in us, to develop perseverance and endurance in our lives. So sometimes when we pray, instead of God taking away the problems, you know, instead of God taking away the circumstances, He will give us the grace to go through such circumstances. Prayer releases God's grace for us to cope with circumstances we cannot change. There are certain circumstances that we cannot change. There are certain circumstances that are unpalatable that we are destined to go through. No matter what, you know, um, we have to go through them. And even when we can pray for such circumstances to change, you know, um, God does not change the circumstances, but rather through our prayers, He grants us the grace to pass through. So there are situations to go through. Um, David says in Psalm 23 verse 6, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. So, the, 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 though I walk through, so there are certain things we have to walk through. 
Uh, there was no other way. David had to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But he says, I fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. So the other thing is, you know, whatever God allows you to go through, he is with you. You don't go through it alone. And so there is an aspect of prayer uh, that releases God's grace in our lives so that we are able to go through things that we're supposed to go through and not necessarily taking away the problems or changing the situation. Instead of changing the situation, God changes us instead. So sometimes the purpose of prayer is to get us out of circumstances, but more often than not, the purpose of prayer is to get us through them. I'm certainly not suggesting we should not pray deliverance prayers, but there are times we need to pray prevailing prayers. There are times we need to say, Lord, if this is the situation you want me to go through, Lord, grant unto me the grace to go through it. For an example, our Lord Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, you know, he, he pleaded with the Father. You know, he prayed the prayer of consecration. He prayed, you know, the prayer of surrender. But he pleaded with the Father. And he prayed the same prayer three times. And the essence of his prayer was, Father, if there is any other way in which you can redeem the human race without me going to the cross, so let it be. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. He resigned and surrendered to God's will. But he was pleading with the Father that if there is any other way, but there wasn't any other way. The only way was the cross. And he surrendered to that way. There wasn't any other way. And, and, and so and the Bible says as he prayed, he, he, you know, he, he dropped sweat like, you know, his sweat, you know, his sweat was like drops of blood. And the Bible says, and the angels came and ministered to him and strengthened him. I believe God was giving him the grace to be able to face the cross. It was not easy. He had to face the cross. And there are times in our lives in our Christian walk and in our lives where there are certain situations that we just have to pass through, that we just have to face. You know, we can pray, we can fast, we can confess, we can declare, but God says, it's okay, but this one, you have to go through this one. And instead of God taking us out of those situations, removing those challenges, he gives us the grace to go through those uh, situations. And we see this in the life of Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8 through 10. You know, uh, Paul spoke about, you know, um, a messenger of Satan, you know, that was buffeting him. And three times he says, I sought the Lord, and the Lord says, my grace is sufficient um, for you. Um, in other words, three times he asked the Lord to remove this thing to deal with this messenger of Satan, which I believe was a demon spirit. It was a demon spirit that was buffeting him, that was agitating him. And he says, for this thing, I besought the Lord three times. He says, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in witnesses. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For then I'm weak, then I'm strong. He says, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. In other words, this thing will not depart from you. This, you know, messenger of Satan, this demon spirit that is buffeting you, that is agitating you, it, it will not be taken away. Instead, I'm going to give you the grace. My grace is sufficient for you. You know, grace is also is God's ability. Um, you know, grace is also defined as God's ability. So I'm going to release upon you my ability to be able to withstand this situation, to be able to endure this situation. I'm not going to um, take away this messenger of Satan because this messenger of Satan is working out my purposes. Because when Paul starts, he says, so that I may, I may not be exalted beyond measure, it was given to me a messenger of Satan. 
In other words, it says, so that I may not be exalted beyond measure because of the abundance of revelations. You see, in other words, Paul was saying, so that I should not be puffed up, I should not be proud. You know, a messenger of Satan was given to me. So, this messenger of Satan, this demon spirit that was, you know, allowed by God to buffet him, served God's purpose in that it was able to ensure that, you know, Paul remain, remains humble. Paul remains humble. And for that, for that cause, God says, I'm not going to take away this demon spirit. He may be inconveniencing you. But the presence of this, you know, demon spirit, this messenger of Satan is serving my purpose. And when he prayed three times, God says, my grace is sufficient for you. And I believe there are some situations, some circumstances that we face in life. We pray, we fast, and we wish God can take us out of them. And we declare, and we confess, and we fast, and we pray, and we declare, and we confess. And, and, and the situations do not change. And we wonder, God, where are you? God is there. And in that instance, God is saying, my grace is sufficient for you. All that which you need now, um, the effect of your prayers is that I'm going to give you grace to go through this. God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. He was giving Paul his power to be set free from the thorn that was buffeting him. Um, however, Paul had to understand how to use God's grace in order to be set free. We need to ask God to give us the grace to sustain, to strengthen, to stand firm, and the willpower to keep on keeping on, even when the circumstances don't seem to change. There's a big difference between praying away and praying through. Sometimes, you know, certain problems, challenges and circumstances that we are trying to pray away, they don't go away, but instead we need to pray through so that God gives us the grace to go through. So there are some challenges, don't get me wrong, there are some challenges that we would pray away, but there are some challenges we may need to pray through. And which challenges do we need to pray away? Which challenges do we need to pray through? That is God's prerogative. Now we are often so anxious to get out of difficult, painful or challenging situations that we fail to grow through them. We are so fixated on getting out of them that we don't get anything out of them. We fail to learn the lessons God is trying to teach us or to cultivate the character God is trying to grow in us. We are so focused on God changing our circumstances that we never allow God to change us. So instead of 10 or 20 years of experience, we have one year of experience repeated 10 or 20 times. Sometimes we need to pray get me out prayers we need to pray those prayers sometimes but sometimes we need to pray get me through prayers and we need discernment to know when to pray get me out prayers or get me through prayers and so one of the one of the ways in which prayer the power of prayer is seen is that it releases god's grace for us to cope with circumstances that we cannot change let's end here and stop here we'll finish this series next sunday and thank you so much for taking the time to be part of this broadcast may the lord richly bless you as you apply the truths that you have learned um this sunday in the first service in the second service and now on the third service may the lord richly bless you see you have a great week ahead and we will see you next Sunday. God bless you.